Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Exercise Rehabilitation and Pulmonary Hypertension Insights and Innovations. My name is Kimberly Brunel, and I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives at PHA Canada. I am joining you today from my home in Mississauga, Ontario. I'd like just to take a moment to acknowledge the lands which constitute the present day city of Mississauga as being part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat and Wyandotte Nations. I am so very grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, and learn on these territories. So without further ado, I really like to welcome our speakers for today's session, Dr. Paul O oh and Dr. Dimitri Rosenberg. Dr. O oh is the Medical Director and Good Life Fitness Chair in the Cardiovascular Disease Prevention and Rehabilitation Program at the University Health Network. He is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto and also a Senior Scientist in the Kite Research Institute and also the Medical Director of the Toronto Rehab Clinical Research Unit. Dr. Dimitri Rosenberg is a Respirologist at the University Health Network and an Assistant Professor at the University of Toronto. Dr. O, oh, Dr. Rosenberg, I thank you both so much for being with us today. Without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Kimberly, for the kind introduction, and uh, I guess we'll uh, get started. Um, we well, The plan is for Dr. O and I to take turns presenting. Um, this will uh, be a, a didactic presentation, but we'll aim to um, uh, take questions towards the end, so please use the chat or the Q&A option. And as um, Kimberly outlined, Today's talk will be on pulmonary rehabilitation for people with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, just a few disclosures. Dr. Paul O has disclosures from Apple for research support, and I do receive salary support from the Sandra Fair and Yvonne Beacon Professorship and Temerity Faculty of Medicine through the University of Toronto, uh, and there are no commercial interests to disclose. The objectives for today's talk are as follows to review traditional structure of pulmonary rehabilitation programs, uh, discuss briefly physiological limitations in pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, Dr. O will highlight the benefits of exercise, uh, specifically in the cardiovascular populations, and focus in on some of the evidence that's available for rehabilitation for pulmonary arterial hypertension as it relates to the most recent guidelines and the Cochrane Review on Mild to Moderate Conditions of Pulmonary Hypertension and then I'll highlight a recent publication from our Toronto Lung Transplant Center that encompasses some of the knowledge that we have to date on severe pulmonary arterial hypertension and transplantation. So we know that pulmonary rehabilitation and chronic lung disease is beneficial. It improves dyspnea, exercise capacity, and muscle strength, uh, improves quality of life, and reduces hospital admissions and mortality. Certainly, this has been uh, more extensively studied in the uh, COPD population, uh, but also in chronic lung diseases, such as pulmonary arterial hypertension, as you'll see from Dr. O's presentation, there's emerging evidence for those conditions as well. In terms of pulmonary rehabilitation, it's a multifaceted um, uh, discipline. And so when we think about pulmonary rehabilitation, we really need to think about several domains specifically uh, including baseline outcome assessments um, and diagnosis and management, which we'll highlight on the subsequent slide, exercise training, which you'll hear uh, further uh, from Dr. O and myself, um, nutritional and energy conservations are certainly important considerations when you're thinking about a rehabilitation program and working with your pulmonary arterial hypertension team, and then optimization of pharmacotherapy and oxygen administration. And more importantly, self-management and goal setting as well are all important elements of rehabilitation. And this was um, a diagram from Dr. Um, Martin Spruy from the Netherlands who led the 2013 guidelines. And as many of you may be aware, the 2023 guidelines that uh, Dr. O will present by Karen Rochester and all have updated uh, some of our uh, uh, PICO questions. Just to define modern uh, pulmonary rehabilitation specifically, um, this is a diagram uh, that's taken from Holland and All, published in the Annals of ATS in 2021, and really was a me workshop meeting that took place with multiple stakeholders in May of 2019, and this is prior to the COVID pandemic. 
And the reason I mention that is some of the recommendations certainly don't encompass um, tele-rehabilitation, which is basically uh, the ability to do exercise in the home environment. And a lot of this really focused in more on in-person rehabilitation with a plan looking forward to doing tele-rehabilitation. But as you can see, based on this modern pulmonary rehabilitation framework, which is quite important across all chronic lung disease states, has four pillars. You've got your patient assessment pillar, you have your program components, you have your method of delivery, and you have your quality assurance. So whatever program you decide to undertake at a program level, many of these programs will focus in on four of these elements. And as you can see, some of these considerations, is it an initial center-based assessment that's required? Usually that will be the case in pulmonary hypertension due to safety concerns that we want to get a good baseline assessment. An excise test at the time of assessment, some form of excise test quality of life measures along with uh, shortness of breath and nutritional consideration and then also the work time balance in terms of occupation, um, in terms of endurance and resistance training is an important element as part of the program. Um, and the program is needs to be individually tailored to the person uh, with multidisciplinary approach where there are multiple uh, players uh, and then healthcare professionals as well. In terms of uh, just stepping back a little bit before we get into what we know in terms of pulmonary arterial hypertension guidelines, a little bit of what we know about pulmonary hypertension in general on the physiological basis. Um, so we know that pulmonary arterial hypertension is uh, a result, as a consequence, uh, as a result of high blood pressure in the arteries, the pulmonary arteries that carry blood from the heart to the lungs. Um, and this can occur at all ages. And uh, when we talk about group one pulmonary hypertension, which I'll show you on the slide, typically occurs at a younger age. Uh, and um, it can cause decreased quality of life and can lead to early death. We are going to focus the presentation today mainly on group one pulmonary arterial hypertension, uh, as there are different classes of pulmonary hypertension, as you'll see on the next slide. And what we do know, though, that exercise-based rehabilitation is safe and improves quality of life in individuals with low to moderate quality of evidence based on the guidelines. And certainly evidence is evolving. This is just a diagram taken from the Canadian uh, Society of um, guidelines uh, on pulmonary hypertension. And as you can see, there are multiple different types of uh, pulmonary hypertension. Um, but really, today's talk will be focusing on group one, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And um, that can be caused from multiple causes. It can be caused due to connective tissue disease, so the rheumatological conditions. It can be caused from certain drug medications. Um, it can also be caused from more rare conditions like pulmonary venoocclusive disease or capillary hemangiotosis. But most of the conditions are idi idiopathic with a small proportion of these group one patients being genetic or familial uh, in nature. There's also a subgroup of patients that have uh, been born with congenital heart disease that can uh, cause group one disease as well. We will not be focusing on other causes um, of pulmonary hypertension. And so this is the statement that I've been referring to, the society position statement that was published in 2020 by Durrani and colleagues, um, and really recommends that exercise rehabilitation be considered in pulmonary arterial hypertension patients to improve functional capacity and health-related quality of life. And we suggest general medical therapeutic measures, um, such as uh, uh, diuretics, uh, um, water pills, and oxygen for resting hypoxemia in all pH patients. And so some of the limitations uh, that we know today is we uh, patients are symptomatic from a shortness of breath standpoint. Um, sometimes they're lightheaded, so that needs to be considered when, with exercise. And certainly they have limitations in their exercise. Um, and given the higher pressures uh, in the heart with progressive disease, there could be significant right ventricular uh, dysfunction, uh, which can cause uh, backward flow of increased fluid and some of those symptoms that I've described with reduced exercise capacity. Further, um, with the higher pressures in the heart, you don't necessarily get that higher cardiac output as well with the contraction of the heart, which is certainly important and has significant downstream effects on the skeletal muscle as well, which Dr. Paul, oh, uh, Dr. O will get into further details um, with reduced oxidative capacity, the way that oxygen actually gets processed at the muscle level. And so this is a diagram taken from the Stanford Educational Panel set. So impaired exercise tolerance, skeletal muscle dysfunction, weakness, 
and fatigue and shortness of breath are all significant. And this is a vicious cycle of physical inactivity, which is seen in a number of chronic lung diseases where individuals that the disease progresses due to inactivity can become more symptomatic. And so it's important to uh, break this vicious cycle if at all possible. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Paulo, who will discuss some of the importance of uh, exercise um, therapy in this population and cardiovascular. Over to you, Dr. O, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. It's indeed a pleasure to be with all of you. And it's a, it's a privilege to um, participate in sessions like this, where we're in interacting directly with persons with a great deal of experience through their lives, as well as some practitioners who work in this space on, on a daily basis and uh, together collaborating. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we are creating better uh, experiences and outcomes. So, so my world is around exercise rehabilitation, as, as mentioned, that I work primarily uh, with, with the individuals who have had a heart kind of issues, but obviously the heart and lungs are so closely intertwined that uh, many of the observations kind of apply equally in, in both settings. Uh, we're fans of exercise in, in our worlds, and, and hopefully you will become as well. And, and perhaps we do the space a little bit of a disservice by labeling it as exercise per se. Uh, I think we can start by saying that movement, physical activity, not sitting around too much, if possible, are all ways that we can become healthier. Uh, if you'll forgive me, I'll, I'll use the term exercise as, as a label that re might represent all of that, but, but I can certainly be challenged. So you can challenge me and say, well, what about these other kinds of activities? Well, well from the kind of the research uh, literature, uh, there, there is information about people being active and doing exercise and that we can improve the body's ability to essentially take in oxygen by breathing it in, transferring it over into the bloodstream, taking it out through the body down to exercising muscles. And that kind of transference allows us to move, to, to function well. And, and, and you know, I know that uh, you think about this, whether implicitly or explicitly all the time in, in, in how you feel. Exercise is good because it can do a couple things for us. It can help us in our middle sections, we call them central adaptations, how the heart and the lungs work together, as well as out in the periphery where our muscles work. So centrally, we can see that at, when people have done a, a structured kind of exercise program for some period of time, we can actually improve the heart's ability to push blood out. That is called cardiac output. Fill the blood with heart, squeeze it, pump the blood with oxygen through the rest of the body. And we can also see an improvement in the body's, the heart's ability to take in a certain amount of blood and then squeeze that out. That's called stroke volume. So become more efficient, become more effective at pumping around that, that healthy blood to, uh, to the body. The next slide talks about the other side of Let's push it out from the heart. Let's get it down to exercising muscles. And at the muscular level, of course, we're aware, like if we if we uh, curl a bicep or, or activate our legs to make us work, that the muscles have to be strong themselves. But even at the microscopic level, that we have the incredible ability of taking that oxygen and transforming it into energy. It's called adenosine diphosphate or adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Think of that like batteries inside of our muscles that need to get energized and moved. And it depends on oxygen getting to those, those centers uh, to make things go. With exercise, we have greater abilities within the cells to generate that en energy. We also have improvement in the amount of blood um, fibers, capillaries that, that uh, surround the muscle. So we get more uh, blood flow and oxygen flow. And we can even change the composition of the muscle to make it into types of muscles that, that allow us to be more activated. So great, great uh, adaptations that happen in our body, both centrally in terms of pushing blood out and at the muscle level in terms of uh, taking that oxygen in and generating energy. Okay, next slide. So then th there then becomes uh, uh, a rationale uh, based upon medical research over time that then informs things like this document, which is the American Thoracic Society guideline that was published just over a year ago 
by Dr. Rosenberg's uh, colleagues. I'm not uh, working particularly in this area specifically, but I do know a number of those authors uh, who have done really great work for many years. And the next slide will speak to what was in those guidelines, you know, guideline folks to bring a whole bunch of really smart people together every few years to look at what's new kind of in the literature or what are some unanswered questions. These folks on this occasion looked at six different major questions. If we advance once, the animation will highlight that this was one of the key questions that they were asking. I, I apologize that the text is so small, but they were looking at the question, should adults with pulmonary hypertension undertake pulmonary rehabilitation? And, um, you know, to, just to go to the end of this, and we're going to fill in all the spaces in between, that, yes, it is a good idea. Uh, and uh, that this smart body of experts said they should, folks with pulmonary hypertension, like that might be on this call, that we would say, yeah, you should do pulmonary rehabilitation. But let's look at the evidence of why. And that's where, we, where the next set of slides come in. So the next slide uh, talks about this thing called the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews. When, when you listen to medical folks, they often bring up this, this term Cochrane database or Cochrane Library. Cochrane refers to a UK-based group of people that look at everything published in, in, in the world and kind of synthesize it together. Of course, you don't have to go to the UK per se to do these reviews, but it, it's still kind of the, the center of where the knowledge synthesis kind of started. And there's a whole art and science on how you can take a bunch of different articles and try to make sense of it. So in this case, Dr. Morris and colleagues undertook a review of the different kinds of studies that were relevant in the field of pulmonary hypertension, very apropos for this discussion. Next slide takes us into a little bit more detail on what they were looking at. So they, you got to start with a, with a kind of a focus question, and their focus question was to evaluate both the benefits and the potential harms of exercise-based rehabilitation. And we want to emphasize here for this part of today's uh, session that I'm going to speak to folks with mild to moderate kind of conditions. And Dr. Rosenberg will round this out with, with the observations in folks who, who have more severe disease. And we're comparing usual care versus, or, or I'm sorry, the exercise we have were versus another group of folks that might have kind of usual care or, or, or really more specifically, no exercise-based rehabilitation. Next slide. So they, they looked at all of the medical literature that was available up until June of 2022. So then you'll say, well, gosh, you're already two years out of date and you're absolutely right. The, the thing that happens with these guidelines processes or these uh, literature overviews is that they go to a certain date and then they become out of date. So there'll be another one, I'm sure, coming in the next number of months or years that will take the next uh, a slice of the, of the literature going um, forward. But what they looked at primarily, and this is important because we can have so-called evidence from a whole bunch of different sources that may be good, that may be okay, or sometimes may just leave you scratching your head. Um, and the highest level of kind of medical evidence comes from these things called randomized control trials, where smart folks will, will design a, a sort of an experiment that will compare one group versus another group. Those two groups kind of look the same, similar age, similar sex breakdown, similar medical profiles. But the only thing that will be different is what you may offer in terms of an intervention. It could be a drug, it could be a surgery, or in this case, it's rehabilitation with exercise. One group gets the exercise, the other group doesn't get the exercise. And then we look for findings between those two groups. So that's where the focus is. Um, and there are other kinds of evidence that don't go into this particular review of the literature. Next slide, please. So when you design one of these kinds of overviews, you select out, okay, I've got my group of interest, and now I want to look at some particular outcomes. And we have to be specific. And in this case, the authors decided that given that we're looking at the effect of an exercise program, the main thing that we're going to look at, first of all, is, is there any measurable difference in exercise capacity? 
If you exercise, should you get stronger, fitter, able to do more? Let's answer that one first of all. The second thing that they want to look at very importantly is, is it safe? Because many folks, including medical practitioners, wonder, hey, sometimes we're worried about people exercising because that might be unsafe. So let's just check that out and, and confirm. And then the third really important outcome, uh, certainly for folks on this call, is do I actually feel better from a physical perspective or a mental perspective or a social perspective? And, and what might the studies tell me about that? So that's wrapped up in this domain called health-related quality of life. And I'm sure that all of these things are very familiar to you. And then in the course of reviews, uh, folks can choose to look at other kind of aspects, like what's going on with those pressures and the blood flow in the heart and the lungs, or how might we grade your ability to, to walk about and function during your day, or are people getting worse in terms of their medical conditions, or are there some, might there be some blood markers that we can look at as well? So those secondary outcomes, I've not, I have not included those because I thought that the first three, there was more than enough data for us to talk about right now. But if you're interested, please look at that Cochrane review and you can get more details about that. And there are summaries for the public that are also available uh, at the website as well. So let's advance the slides and let's look at the next kind of outcomes that we were looking at. So the, the interventions of interest are rehab or exercise kind of programming. And the intervention involves typically in rehab, both aerobic and strength or resistance training. And both of them are very important in the whole fitness and function equation. You need to do both to develop the best kind of outcomes around aerobic capacity, our abilities to walk and move and muscle strength. Think my ability to get up and move around and lift things uh, through my day. We'll talk a little, bit, a little bit more detail in the next slide about what we mean by aerobic exercise. And the cartoon kind of stylizes all different kinds of things. And the, and the answer is there's no just one thing. <laughs> there's aerobic exercise, excuse me. But the, the, the common feature about all of these activities is that they involve activation of big muscles in our legs, in our core, in our arms that move around over an extended period of time, usually repetitively, so that we can kind of stress out the heart just a little bit, just the right amount. And we can breathe a little bit harder so that we start to pump things around in our body. Um, and typically aerobic exercise in the pulmonary uh, hypertension rehabilitation literature, the programs that were designed had aerobic exercise that lasted between 20 and 40 minutes in duration, customized to perhaps the activity that people could do, that they enjoyed, and the duration then would fit um, what was tolerable for an individual. So 20 to 40 minutes, remember in your head this rough number, if I can do this half an hour a day, then I'm doing pretty well. Next slide talks about the resistance component. And resistance exercises are those where we kind of stress our muscles against some, some force that, that's holding us back. This, uh, and this builds strength. This cartoon or this panel is, is an image from our own website, uh, from our rehab program, that we can share with you. They're, they're good for people living with heart conditions, with heart failure. Some of those folks will have pulmonary hypertension as well. But the idea, again, is that you can work out the upper lower body. You'll see that nobody is doing squats and, 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 and huge deadlifts or bench presses here. It can be very light weights or it could be resistance bands where muscles are indeed getting stronger. Typically, we describe sets of exercises like do a bicep curl 10 times at a nice pace with just a little bit of resistance where we're feeling just a little bit short of breath with that. And, and, and that's the way to design a program. So think about upper body, core exercises, and lower body, and that's how we can get the whole body stronger. Next slide. So there are different ways of constructing aerobic and resistance together. Um, and delivering it in different kinds of settings. In the literature that was re reviewed for this particular uh, um, 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 publication, they looked at primarily supervised programs. That is, 
patients, persons with lived experience, we're working with a professional, an exercise professional, maybe a kinesiologist or a physiotherapist or a nurse um, who was meeting with that individual on an outpatient basis or sometimes on an inpatient basis. But very importantly, this need not be face-to-face -face directly, that it could also be remote. And Dr. Rosenberg's going to talk about some of those remote opportunities. Typically, folks met together two or three times per week for at least four weeks. And in our rehab programs that we offer up, we may meet face-to-face -face once or twice or three times a week, but we also invite people to do a couple more days a week so that we get a dose of exercise about five days per week. 30 minutes a day, five days a week equals 150 minutes per week. Four weeks, I would say, is the minimum to get us started and get those muscles and heart adaptations going. I would say if we can get to eight, 12, or even more, as a program, then we're starting to see some really good physiologic changes. And then the magic happens, of course, when we all embrace this as a lifestyle, that this is things that we need to do on a daily basis. This is part of our work forevermore. And that's how we get healthy and stay healthy. In terms of how hard the exercise needs to be, we, we label that as intensity. Um, how hard are you working? And, you know, intensity is can be characterized as light, they can be moderate or medium, or they can be high, uh, very vigorous. And for many people who are living with a condition affecting the heart or lungs, we might wanna start a little bit lower, move into the moderate territory. For some special situations, we could move to higher, but the moderate kind of space is nice. It's kind of the Goldilocks principle, not too little, not too much, but just right. And if we can build that routine, then we see those adaptations in heart and lungs and muscles to help us feel better overall and get us training, okay? So next slide, finally, we're gonna to get to some results. I think there was a question that popped up. Tell us what's going on. Okay, so when we up, um, when folks apply themselves and, and, and kind of enter into those rehabilitation kinds of programs, we can do some measurements of effect. And we said we wanna look at does exercise change exercise capacity? Well, and the answer is yes. We can measure exercise capacity in different ways. And one of them is simply a walked distance. You know, if you've gone to programs, uh, pulmonary area programs, or you've seen your healthcare team, they may ask you to walk for six minutes in the corridor. Typically walk for 30 meters, turn around, come back, turn around, keep going. And walk as far as you can in six minutes minutes. This is an interesting kind of research and clinical assessment that we have adopted uh, in, in many kind of settings, because there is pretty good correlation with the uh, walking, the distance that you walk in that was six minutes, and how you might function in your daily life. And if you enter, if you enter a program and do this, uh, this kind of exercise programming, physical activity movement, over that period of time, and if you can gain about 50 meters in distance, well, that is often associated with better health outcomes over the long term. So that's really cool. So interestingly, in the pulmonary hypertension rehab literature, when they looked at exercise capacity as measured by six-minute walks, people that did not do the rehab programs tended to be stay the same, or in fact, get a little bit worse in their abilities to walk six minutes when they checked at the baseline in 12 weeks. But folks who did the rehab programs gained about 50 meters, interestingly. And this was seen as an important and large increase in that six-minute walk distance. Next slide will take us through one more result of exercise capacity, I believe, um, as measured by peak oxygen capacity. And this is the body's ability to bring in oxygen via lungs to heart, circulate it out to muscles, extract it, and then generate the horsepower that we talked about before. And in the people that don't do exercise, no surprise that people don't get better in their oxygen capacity. It stays the same or gets a little bit worse. In contrast, people who do exercise will enjoy a gain in this oxygen capacity. Think about like gaining horsepower for your car. 
And this magnitude of change of two milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute is actually quite a substantial increase in people's ability to kind of bring in utilized, bring in deliver utilized oxygen. And again, higher VO2 means more horsepower, and it also translates to better health outcomes down the road. And then the next one will take us through the quality of life measure, I believe. Yeah. So when uh, quality of life was assessed for people that did not do exercise, no surprise, quality of life as measured by physical questions, like your ability to do stuff and mental questions, like how do you feel? Well, it tends to stay the same or in fact get worse if you don't do exercise rehab programs, but it improves substantially if you do the exercise programming. So there's lots of really good benefits of the exercise rehab program. Next slide will say, well, is there a downside to this? And their summary of the serious adverse events that happened through the course of the studies involving several hundred people. Well, in the people that didn't exercise, there was actually one bad thing that happened, like an injury or hospitalization. But in the folks who did exercise, there were none. Now, I can't say that exercise is perfect and it's perfectly safe for everybody, but on balance, there wasn't a signal that things were going to get a whole lot worse. Um, so uh, kind of my my feeling about this is that not uncommonly people are told, well, just sit, just rest, don't get active, don't do the physical activity because that might be dangerous for you. In fact, my feeling is the opposite, that it's very important for us to get active in a safe way because it leads to all of these kinds of benefits. And if you don't do it, it's actually a whole lot worse. Consider that an adverse event. Okay, a couple more slides just to round out my section. I'll flip it back to Dr. Rosenberg. So not surprisingly then, the American Thoracic Society guidelines kind of took this evidence as well as a bunch of other studies to say these as their conclusions. For people with pulmonary hypertension, including those with pulmonary arterial hypertension, we found evidence that rehabilitation delivered important improvements in the critical outcomes of exercise capacity and that there were improvements in quality of life. Um, and for people with P, uh, pulmonary hypertension undertaking the rehab programs, as Dr. Rosenberg showed, that it's not just about exercise. We focused on that right now, but there's other th important things that happen like education about how to exercise safely and how to live with uh, well with the condition, how to modify activities, how to conserve energy, and undertaking the supervised exercise sessions was, was deemed to be a value not only to exercise but to engage with others and to re receive psychological support was really quite important here as well uh, as part of the programs. And the final slide for my section, I think, is that they did not find any safety concerns with the exercise, but of course, we will want to be mindful and you will want to be mindful that if there are any kind of yellow flags or red flags to go up, like my chest is hurting or I'm feeling like my heart is racing, especially irregularly, or I'm feeling dizzy, then those are flags to us to adjust the exercise programs. Take a rest right now, maybe do something a little bit differently, but it can be done and it can be done safely. Thanks. I think that's my section and I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. O, for that nice overview of the literature. And so Dr. O covered what we know today on uh, pulmonary hypertension is that it relates to the mild to moderate disease states. Not going to get into the clinical side of things, how we define mild to moderate, but oftentimes uh, clinically we focus in on symptoms, how far you can walk, that six-minute walk test that Dr. Uh, o described. And part of that also depends on how recent your diagnosis was. Um, but based on the guidelines and the evidence that we have today, there's still a lack of information on people on the other side of the spectrum with this pulmonary hypertension disease, specifically as it relates to people with something called double the Wuhan's number four disease. So very short of breath, even doing activities of daily living around the home. Um, and other factors such as shortness of breath and fatigue have not been studied to the same degree as uh, quality of life or exercise capacity. Um, and in terms of long-term benefits, as we're talking about a year and a half to two years out and even five-year outcomes with rehabilitation, how to maintain that program have not been studied to the same degree as in other disease states. 
And then the other area that's emerging, and we still don't know how to tackle it in pulmonary arterial hypertension, is how do we deliver safe exercise in the home environment is what we call telerehabilitation. Because most of the studies that were shown today so far have really been in person um, facility-based uh, exercise and something we can discuss as well towards the end. And so I'd like to present to you our experience with the Toronto Lung Transplant Program, which is one of the largest programs in the world uh, that has a large pulmonary arterial hypertension, relatively large. Um, I mean, if you think about it, it's around 5% that get transplanted with pulmonary hypertension. Um, however, we looked at our experience over a five-year period, and we just recently published that. And this was a cohort from 2014 to 2019, so pre-COVID. Um, we know that individuals on the wait list have significant symptoms, uh, short of the breath, they can experience lightheadedness and experience those day-to-day -day activities. Um, and in our program and many programs around the world, pulmonary rehabilitation before lung transplantation is mandatory uh, to develop that muscle strength and that fitness to, uh, to tolerate the surgery. And so we really wanted to describe our experience uh, with regards to exercise and tolerance and safety in this group of very severe uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension patients that experience NYHA class three to four symptoms. So very significant shortness of breath, despite being on multiple uh, pharmacotherapy agents, I'll show. And so as I highlighted, this was our single center retrospective experience. We were able to identify 40 uh, individuals that were listed that had group one pulmonary arterial hypertension. And the mean age of these individuals was around 50 years old. The uh, three quarters were female and the mean pulmonary arterial pressure was around 53. Uh, and remember, um, a diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension is made when that pressure is above 20 at rest on a right heart catheterization. And certainly this is considered very severe disease when you've got values in the 50, especially on pharmacotherapy at the time of lung transplant. And so we looked at these individuals who are required to exercise in our program three times a week, coming in person. Uh, we looked at their ability to, what they could do on the treadmill, what they can do in terms of their big muscles, uh, the biceps and the quadriceps uh, muscles, uh, and looked at their aerobic training as well. So I'll highlight that as well. As I highlighted, uh, the requirement in our program is two to three times per week during this time period. And I'll talk about how things have changed with the COVID pandemic as we transition to a hybrid program. Uh, but what I'm describing here is an in-person rehabilitation program. And each session was comprised of around 90 minutes where individuals will do aerobic, uh, a little bit of cycling and treadmill exercises, and then also resistance training. And we typically try to do one set of where um, uh, patients can do up to 10 repetitions of a particular exercise. So if they're doing biceps, they can do 10 of those. If they're doing some exercise for their quadriceps, they can do that as well. And we've described our rehabilitation experience. Uh, Lisa Wickerson and colleagues have described in the World Journal of Transplant in 2016 in more detail. But ultimately, for the pulmonary hypertension group, we try to focus on a, something called the modified Borg dyspnea score, be, maintaining around two to three, which is considered a mild, kind of borderline moderate dyspnea. We target that range so they don't feel too strenuous of an activity, uh, but are still able to exercise for about 20 minutes on the treadmill or the bike and do enough of that one set of the muscle. Lift. And we're making cognizant to maintain their oxygen saturation at 88% or higher, as we know, individuals who desaturate with pulmonary hypertension has a kind of a reciprocal effect. If you drop your oxygen, the pressures in the blood vessels at pulmonary arterial uh, actually constrict, get tighter and make things worse. So we want to try to avoid that as best as possible. And so with our experience of the 40 lung transplant candidates, remember this is a group that's very sick. The median time on the transplant list to waiting transplantation was three months. We had 34 patients that went, went on to be transplanted, as you can see in uh, green uh, lines. And four patients, unfortunately, had passed away on the, uh, while waiting for transplantation. And then two patients were medically delisted for other causes outside of their cardiopulmonary limitations. Uh, however, what I do want to highlight, given how sick this group is, despite being on multiple agents for their hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, 
16 out of the 40 required at least one admission to hospital while they were waiting for transplantation. Uh, and the good thing is these individuals were able to return back to rehabilitation. So nine out of the 16 now had at least one admission were able to return to outpatient rehabilitation where seven had to wait in hospital for transplantation highlighting the importance of delivering rehabilitation in the inpatient setting as well. And that's something that needs to be considered and developed further, uh, specifically in this patient population. I want to highlight that many of the patients required supplemental oxygen. So more than 50% in this group needed supplemental oxygen, and it was quite variable. Um, so uh, anywhere from one to four liters, five to nine liters, and 12 liters, and some even needed 15 or more of oxygen. Um, similarly to the Cochrane review, we did not observe any major cardiovascular events related to physical exertion or pH therapy. Um, we did have one person who uh, experienced a little bit of chest tightness and neck tightness, which was modified. Uh, they went from treadmill to bike um, and had result. Uh, and then similarly, we had looked at um, pharmacotherapy. Um, as many of our patients, you could see 68% were at least on two medications and some were on three medications. Um, and so infusion site pain was observed in two individuals, uh, but as soon as the site was changed or the way the administration was given, they were able to resume pulmonary rehabilitation. And this is something that you need to work with your healthcare providers during any exercise program, is if you're on prostaglandin therapy with intravenous, they need to be aware of that and adapt the exercises accordingly to make sure it's safe to exercise as well with that in mind. In our program, looking at those big muscles, the biceps and the quadriceps, you can see here over a three month period on average, um, there was significant improvements in their training volume. So that's repetitions and the, uh, and the weights that they can do um, by around 13 for the biceps and the quadriceps. Um, and then interestingly, the treadmill speed also went up by about 0 0.4 um, uh, miles per hour, and then just highlighting that oxygen uptake that Dr. O was describing from the Cochrane review, where you could see when we calculated their VO2 peak uh, from the treadmill exercises, so mils per kilogram per minute, um, it went up by an average by 1.66, so lower th than what you see in the mild to moderate cases. But you could still see that these individuals derive significant benefits, both with regards to their aerobic and their muscle training volume. So even, so that's important to have. And using that test, that six minute walk test where we get individuals to walk for six minutes um, and see how far they've gone. Remember, this is a group that has very severe pulmonary hypertension. And so if left untreated or even over time, unfortunately deteriorated. Um, and so this is actually quite impressive to see that there wasn't actually a lowering of the six minute walk distance that many who uh, were on the list to, to get a second uh, six minute walk test done, which is often done six weeks or three months in our program, every three months had stabilization or an improvement by around 20 meters or so. Now you can argue whether this is minimally important difference or not. It's not, does it meet the threshold of around 30 meters? But the nice thing about this is you could see the trajectories are generally stable in their six minute walk distances um, that are around the 50% mark. Certainly there's gonna be variability from patient to patient, uh, but this is reassuring to see. And then when we look at their uh, Borg dyspnea uh, scales and their exertional scales, including the leg fatigue, um, baseline is outlined in blue and in red we have the final, so like the final available at the, right before transplantation, um, you could see that there's also that stabilization effect. We didn't see any worsening, uh, which is nice to see in a very severe pulmonary hypertension population for both the shortness of breath side of things at rest and with exertion, and also the same thing at, um, at rest and for uh, leg fatigue. Similarly, when we looked at their cardiac parameters off the six minute walk test, where we can derive parameters with, at rest before they do their six minute walk test, at the end of the six minute walk test, and one minute after, there are certain parameters that we can look at. Um, certainly, given how severe this group is, uh, they have something what we call chromotropic incompetence. So, the, the ability of their heart, the, the nerves to regulate their heart rate wasn't as good, unfortunately, as compared to healthy individuals. 
And what a marker that's been defined in the literature, even in mild to moderate homeohypertension and more severe, is a cutoff of 12 beats per minute, the ability to recover. So many of our individuals, unfortunately, have significant chronotropic incompetence. Um, and to, um, in a few, it actually dropped towards the latter part. Uh, but reassuringly, many of our uh, patients could exercise um, up to 75% of their maximal heart rate uh, based on age, which is reassuring, highlighting that moderate uh, exercise intensity that Dr. O was emphasizing as well. So to summarize, uh, we know that um, patients with uh, Homey arterial hypertension awaiting lung transplantation have very severe disease uh, with the progressive course, but their exercise capacity could be maintained. Um, and it's very important to consider the inpatient side of things. What can we deliver and uh, advocate for these patients if they get admitted to hospital? What kind of exercises can we provide uh, given uh, the high proportion of individuals that we observe admitted to hospital for multiple causes such as right-sided heart failure? So some future considerations uh, further, we do need more studies uh, as highlighted in the Cochrane review. Um, our experience in our, is one center only, and actually it's the only study in the literature to date that describes very severe homeo hypertension uh, with NYHA class four symptoms. So we need more studies to that. Um, we also need to understand that how do we deliver exercise in a safe environment through a hybrid program? And certainly at our center, we've adapted a hybrid program where we get comfortable with the patients in the first four weeks, and then we get them to exercise at a, through video um, in an asynchronous fashion, which I'll go through on the next slide, where they can exercise on their own, but they are followed closely by the physiotherapists in the program. Um, certainly, the tele-rehabilitation strategies are not new post-COVID pandemic and even before the pandemic were available, but there have been more uh, descriptions of those experiences, predominantly in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or in interstitial lung disease, and certainly fewer in pulmonary hypertension. Um, and when we think about tele-rehabilitation considerations, they're going to be very different from center to center. And so this is where you'll need to talk to your program of excellence, to, and I'll show you a, a map of the Canadian pulmonary hypertension centers. What kind of program could they deliver for you? If, if they feel comfortable with you exercising in a supervised fashion, um, so synchronous versus asynchronous. So synchronous, their physiotherapist is monitoring you during the exercises versus asynchronous, they give you some exercise that you can do in the home environment uh, and then report back. Um, will they use, uh, what kind of uh, technology will they use video? Are they gonna use smartphones and tablets? Are they gonna do a group program where they may have four individuals exercising at one time versus individual? Uh, and then what kind of monitoring will they provide for cardiac and oximetry monitoring? What kind of equipment will they ask you uh, to purchase? Now, I wanna highlight when I mentioned tele-rehabilitation and exercise training, I'm referring to a more formal program where you're consistently progressing that aerobic and then muscle training. Uh, but some, some don't have dedicated rehabilitation programs at your center. This is where you'll need to talk, work with your team and see uh, where they can refer you to a close pulmonary rehabilitation program and work with your pulmonary rehabilitation team across Canada to deliver exercise in a safe fashion. And there's also alternative options of promoting physical activity as well, where you can do walking in the hallway with appropriate oxygen requirements or outdoors. And this is something where you liaise with your teams closely as well. And there's a number of centers, both pediatric and adult, uh, across Canada, just kind of highlighting, as you can see, uh, many of the centers are obviously within Ontario, uh, but there are programs out east as well. Uh, and uh, many of my colleagues work in those programs and, um, and out west as well with programs uh, developing. And so I'd like to end the presentation there, a formal didactic talk and open up the floor to questions. Uh, and I'll stop sharing so we could see um, the, the questions come through the chat and the question and answer period. And we'd love if you can unmute the mic and ask those questions as well, as opposed to just the question and answer period. Thank you once again. And just a reminder that uh, questions are being also recorded. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O and Dr. Rosenberg. That was great just to see so many 
uh, really positive results for patients in the PH community, irregardless of the severity of disease. So I appreciate you presenting, you know, sort of all of those pieces. Oh, okay, there's a bunch of questions coming in here. Um, Dr. Oh, I think you already addressed, uh, Sharon had a question about BMP. I wonder if perhaps you could just summarize your um, response, just in case folks didn't see it in the, um, in the chat. So Sharon is asking about some of the preliminary results that Dr. O had presented. It was asking about if there were any um, changes in BNP results. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Sharon, for the question. Uh, we know that BNP is, is sort of a marker of stress in the heart, right? And and in my, my world, that uh, when uh, folks are experiencing greater difficulties with the heart or so-called heart dysfunction or heart failure, that those BNP levels may be high, especially under periods of stress. Uh, one of the things that we look at for the heart to be kind of in a more restful state is for those BNP levels to go down. Theoretically, exercise might be one of those ways of, of relaxing the heart and bringing those levels down. So it's a great question. In the literature synthesis from the Cochrane Review, there are only like four studies um, out, of the, out of the 16 or so that actually measured BNP. Numerically, the value was a little bit lower, but there wasn't enough certainty in that data to make any conclusion. So the author said that there's no difference with exercise or no exercise in the BNP levels. It doesn't mean that one doesn't exist, but at least in the studies that have been done to date, they're unable to document a, a difference in those levels. I still think exercise is good though. <laughs> Agreed. And like you said, there's so many other things that impact your BNP levels from minute to minute, day to day, that um, I'm sure there's exercise benefits, but probably hard to measure. Um, so Tari has got a question here in the chat. I'll, I'll do my best to summarize it. Um, I, I think a lot of patients will have said this to us before that there is an often a high cost to exercise. So folks will do a little bit one day and then as Taria mentions, pay for it for a couple of days later and sort of have to be in bed and can't do very much. And so sometimes exercise feels like it's not really worth it because you, you just can't really bounce back a day or two later. Um, so she has a question. Do you have any suggestions for getting over that hump to get to a place where I can exercise enough to gain some of the long longer term benefits. Maybe Dr. O can entertain that question. Okay, I can start. And then I, I think uh, Dr. Rosenberg, like the, mm -hmm. the conversations that we often have around energy conservation, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it sure. as well. And um, so I would say one, thank you for kind of sharing your experience. And um, we have great empathy for the notion that it's sometimes it's hard get, getting through the day, right? There's We're busy. There's many things that, that uh, are a pull on our time and our energy. Uh, we recognize that with certain conditions, whether they're heart or lung or other kinds of conditions, we've seen this in COVID, for instance, that folks all, sometimes feel like they've got a fixed envelope of energy or the battery that only has certain capacity. And once we use that, it really drains down. If we drain it too much, boy, it's actually hard to recover. It takes a full day or more to recharge it. So it's kind of being aware of that as much as possible of how much energy we have in any given day and finding the opportunity to work within that capacity. And progress can be very small. I'm encouraged by the the, the comment in the Q&A of someone sharing their experience that it took a long time to build up to 30 minutes. And sometimes our notions of exercise is, oh boy, I better buy the new shoes and the spandex and get out there and start running. And we know that that's a recipe for, for not being able to get to the places that we want. So let's go slow. Let's think about the other activities that we're doing. Sometimes thinking if I'm doing an exercise or physical activity day, maybe I could back off on something else that day because there's only so much uh, and building it from there. And success may be measured as a minute more, as opposed to an hour more. Yeah, and Dr. Th Rosemark. Thank you, uh, Dr. O, for that overview. Um, and I, I echo the same, uh, Tarla, and thank you for sharing that experience. It's not an uncommon experience uh, for many uh, individuals with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, 
and chronic lung disease. One thing that we need to be mindful of and something you can check for sure uh, is get an, a good oximeter, check your oxygen saturation levels to make sure you're not dropping into that 80% range because that could also give you some fatigue and talk to your healthcare provider. Look at your heart rate response, um, uh, but setting realistic and small goals. And if, if it's a long work day, then maybe you need to break it up and not do exercise that day and then try to kind of see like, hmm, maybe I'll get one day in on the weekend and maybe midweek. Uh, but certainly from a medical standpoint, something to just keep an eye on your oxygen saturation, heart rate, listen to your muscles as well to make sure there's not a delayed muscle soreness. You may have to back off a little bit if the weights are too much or you're uh, doing uh, a bit too much walking, but slow uh, may definitely will make progress when you get adjusted for that endurance level. Hope that helps. Great advice. Thanks for the question, Taria. Uh, Sharon mentions in the chat that she is in a healthy heart cardiovascular exercise program with the Y. It's live, live on Zoom, life changing. I know there's lots of great virtual programs. Um, perhaps afterwards, uh, Dr. Dr. Rosenberg, if you have any that we can share with the community that are either on YouTube or through the programs that you work on, I'd be happy to to share those. Um. I uh, we have an anonymous question in the chat. Uh, it took me a long time to get there, but I currently do 30 minutes every day of elliptical machine. I am unable to increase resistance even after four years. It takes me two to four minutes to get a decent rhythm so that I can continue, albeit slowly, but steadily without getting lightheaded. I feel this is good and I don't feel any more shortness of breath than anyone, who, anyone else who exercises. My issue, however, is that I can never increase the speed and still have only about three 340 meters on the six minute walk test. My lightheadedness is my limiting factor. If I push speed, I end up feeling like I'll pass out. I also get far too short of breath. Any thoughts on the feeling of passing out? Great question. So I'll, I'll try to, so thank you for sharing that experience. And certainly uh, that is one of the cardinal features of this condition, pulmonary arterial hypertension, where individuals will feel shortness of breath and that pre syncopal symptoms or that feeling of passing out. And certainly you want to listen to your body very closely. You don't want to have that feeling that you're going to pass out because that's quite dangerous as well. And um, so you, and sometimes if you get, get that feeling frequently, you may need to modify the type of elliptical training you're doing. There are elliptical machines that you can do in a, in a sitting position or in a bike, which would be potentially safer. Certainly you also need to speak to your healthcare provider because um, that feeling of passing, feeling like you may pass out, that pre-syncopal feeling, if it's happening more frequently, that could be a disease progression. And you need to speak to your team about that. Do they need to modify your medications? Is your oxygen level appropriate? So, you know, I, I think that's on an individual level. Um, the other question about the six minute walk, that's the 340 meters. Um, you know, that is a marker that we use clinically uh, but it is a global measure of how your muscles and your cardiovascular system. And unfortunately, many individuals with pulmonary arterial hypertension, given the progressive nature of this condition, um, despite all of the great benefits that you're deriving for exercise, may not be able to increase the six-minute walk test. But you can also argue that if you weren't exercising, that six-minute walk test, as we've seen in the, in the lung transplant population, would actually, it could decline even further. Um, so I congratulate you on exercising regularly, make sure you're staying safe and speaking to your healthcare provider about your symptoms, but it's actually a good thing to see that your six minute walk test has remained stable for a number of years. Uh, and so uh, I hope that helps. I don't know if Dr. Ello has some additional comments to that yeah. response. Uh, only that I concur with with the congratulations and, and uh, we're all very uh, admiring of the program that you've been able to set up. I think this is awesome. I think there are limits for anybody. I can't walk very fast on a six minute walk. I've got very short little legs <laughs> and there's there's definitely a ceiling to how far I can go. Um, so so that's OK. You're staying at a healthy level. And remember that the, the most of the gains in exercise are at the beginning. And getting from no minutes to five or 10 minutes, that's awesome. Getting to 30 minutes, you've done most of the work here. So just keep it up. And that's a success every single day that you can do that. So, th so thanks for that. Thank you. Um, 
I'm going to go back to the chat here. And so Renee's asking, is there a healthy or wise ceiling for your heart rate? My heart rate increases quickly. O2 drops to mid upper 80s after about three minutes on my six minute walk. So I can try to attack. So from a, from a, from a hypertension uh, standpoint, Certainly there's gonna be variability in the heart rate. Every person with chronic lung disease outside of even pulmonary hypertension typically starts off, depending on the severity, at a much higher heart rate than uh, age sex matched healthy control. Um, so it's not unusual to see heart rate sometimes at 80 or 90 beats per minute as the disease progresses. Now, depending on your level of conditioning, depending on the severity of your pulmonary hypertension, that heart rate for a given amount of work can really go up in a pretty steep fashion uh, by 30 or 40 beats per minute, certainly kind of keeping with the consistency of that moderate training range. We like to see it somewhere in the 65 to 80 percent range of your age match, um, your age predicted heart rate. So that's 220 minus your age will give you what your maximal heart rate should be. And then in whatever your heart rate you're getting. With that said, though, once again, it's going to be very different per individual, depending on what you're doing, you need to listen to your symptoms. That's the more important thing. Uh, you do need to speak to your healthcare provider as well to make sure if your heart rate's going up, there aren't other things that may be contributing to that high heart rate. There are certain types of rhythms like atrial fibrillation that can be seen, uh, depending on the individual's age that can raise or arrhythmias. So that's very important. Um, in terms of the six minute walk test, this is a test that I use very, we all use clinically uh, in, a, in a frequent fashion. I can reassure you at least that on the six minute walk test, it's one of the more exerting uh, tests that you're gonna do in your day to day life. And so that oxygen level could drop uh, not after two minutes, three minutes, not unusual to drop in the upper 80s. And if it's dropping further, this is where you'll speak to your healthcare provider and make decisions whether you do need supplemental oxygen use with exercise, because it's a, it's a marker saying with enough strenuous activity, your oxygen may be dropping, you may benefit from supplemental oxygen. So I'll stop there. Hopefully that was helpful. Thank you. And I, I think Miriam in the Q and A box here has the question of the hour, which is how do pulmonary hypertension patients access these types of programs if it's appropriate for them? Yeah. So it's a very good question. Uh, as the literature has uh, shown, uh, pulmonary hypertension and the evidence is accumulating in our experience across in the lung field and the cardiology field is growing with the pulmonary hypertension patients, specifically with group one. Um, certainly the best uh, resource is about such a large country is speak to your uh, primary healthcare center, uh, your program of excellence that's managing your pulmonary hypertension. They will have some resources or suggestions on where the nearest program could be. They may be partnered with local community centers. They may be partnered with local pulmonary rehabilitation centers that have quite a bit of expertise in delivering uh, rehabilitation to patients with chronic lung disease. And they will be able to tailor the program in correspondence. Now, it, it, certainly there's also the Canadian Thoracic Society that has a list of um, pulmonary rehabilitation programs that may be available for you to be referred to by your healthcare providers. Uh, we can also look through the Pulmonary Hypertension Canada, see if we could develop some resources through there that we could share uh, that may be programs that are accessible that you can call. Um, so those are just some ideas. And then also within the group here, there's been some suggestions within cardiovascular programs that have accepted pulmonary hypertension patients uh, that you may want to try if they're available uh, within your local center. And I'll also uh, let Dr. O comment because he has got uh, many more years of experience on uh, delivering cardiovascular rehab. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so the, the other resource might be the cardiac rehab programs that are in your community. So your cardiologist or uh, respiratory specialist may know about uh, those programs. And uh, again, we've certainly seen people with pulmonary hypertension uh, when it when it relates to heart conditions. Uh, the kinds of exercise programming may be quite similar, uh, and certainly the the expertise can be be shared across. So it, it may be one more resource. There are certainly more cardiovascular rehab programs than there are pulmonary rehab programs across the country.
And would you typically need to be referred into a pulmonary rehab program? So that would be through your, your pH center, as you mentioned, Dr. Rosenberg. Correct. Usually most pulmonary rehabilitation centers um, who have a profession, exercise professional associated with them require a referral uh, from a healthcare profession. That's good to know. Oh, I see uh, lots of comments. Sharon, you're just a rock star out there swimming <laughs> and working out at the Y. So if people have questions, hit up uh, hit up Sharon for that. But uh, yeah, I do agree. Swimming is uh, thoughts on swimming um, as being a great way to exercise. So I, I think that, um, again, there's a variety of activities that, that are beneficial. Um, if you're a good swimmer, let, let's start with that. If you're a good swimmer, it can be quite tolerable. If you're a bad swimmer, boy, do you expend a lot of energy. I'm in that category. <laughs> so it's it's hard, much harder for me to do that. Um, the, the, and, and I love, you know, AquaFit, Warm Pool. I, I think those are really, really great things. The, the only caution sometimes we offer up about swimming, especially when we're not sure about how our body responds, is that, you know, there is this potential little concern that if you get into trouble in a pool, it, it's harder just to stop than it might be if you're on a treadmill or, or something else. But so just be mindful of that. Test it out. Go slow. And that'd be my other comment for the individual, Rene, who talked about heart rates going too fast on a six-minute walk. I agree completely. Six-minute walks are not designed well for your body, right? Because we ask you to go as fast as you can in six minutes. I think the warm-up is really, really critical. And doing 10 or even 15 minutes of gentle warm-up, get the heart rates responding slowly, get the oxygen distributed properly is really good. So if you're in the pool or if you're on land, do that slowly and, and just be mindful of that. Yeah. I just want to add as well, I mean, uh, obviously, it's a diverse group that we have here today with different disease severities, but uh, swimming or other activities, you need to work with your healthcare providers and just be mindful. Swimming uh, is reasonable with oxygen if you can put the oxygen tank at the side, uh, but may not be as practical. And then also with prostaglandin therapy, intravenous therapy, infusion therapy may not be as practical with water considerations. Um, so this is something that you need to work with your team as well closely on. Okay. Well, Dr. O, Dr. Rosenberg, thank you both so much. This has been a topic that our community has been asking for more information about for quite some time. So I really appreciate all of the research and just your expertise that you brought to the table today. If anyone in the community has just more questions or questions about access or questions about programs they can do at home, please feel free to reach out to me and I can I can reach out to these wonderful gentlemen to get some help. Um, but I do like the idea of creating some type of a resource that we can share with the community about how to access some of these programs that might be virtual or in the community. And again, if you have questions, please speak to your wonderful uh, experts in your pH clinics um, and try to get those referrals if they're appropriate for you. Again, thank you so much. Everyone have a great day and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.